Hello, and welcome to the Dr. Rebecca Baxt podcast. I'm Dr. Rebecca Baxt, board-certified dermatologist, and I'm here to discuss with you all issues relating to the skin that you're in. In this podcast, we will tackle the topic of the day quickly to get you the take-home points that you need. After listening to an episode, you should be educated about the topic and able to fix the issue yourself or well-prepared to ask the right questions at your next dermatology appointment. Let's get started. Today, we are going to talk about nails. Nails are very complicated. I'd like to focus on common nail issues that I see pretty much every week, and I'm going to focus on four. The first one is onycholysis, and that's when the nail plate lifts off of the nail bed, and so the nail looks white where it should really be attached and look more pinkish. Second, we can talk about onychomycosis, which is a fungal or yeast infection of the nail. And that can cause the first thing, onycholysis, but it can also cause thickening and debris of the nail. Third, I'd like to talk about brittle nails and ridged nails together. And fourth, I'd like to talk about pigmentary lines on the nails. So four main topics that covers a lot of nail problems And just to be clear, these can be on the fingernails or toenails. Let's start with the most common complaint that I get about nails, which is onycholysis, which is a fancy term for when the nail plate or the nail itself has separated away from the nail bed and it becomes detached and causes it to be a bit whitish. This is often mistaken for a fungal infection because the patient sees that the nail is white where it's supposed to be pink. They Google it and they think it's a fungus. And most of the time it's not. It's often fairly easy to clip a piece of the nail and send it for testing, but I can often tell just by looking at it and how many nails are affected and where the white area is, I can often tell if there's a fungus there or not just by looking at it. Onycholysis is most commonly caused by trauma to the nail bed and not per se a fungus. I would say onycholysis or the separating of the nail plate from the nail bed causing the white discoloration is most commonly from trauma, and that is usually overprocessing at the nail salon. But it can also be from ill-fitting shoes or runner's toe from constantly banging the front of the toe into the front of the shoe. And so once the diagnosis has been made, if the patient can clip the nail short and avoid the offending trauma that's causing it, it typically heals on its own and reattaches. It can take a number of months, but it usually goes away on its own. I will often also recommend for this issue to keep the nails out of water. So if you do dishes or cleaning to wear gloves during that, soaking the hands in water can make onycholysis worse. Moisturizing is good for this condition, and I often recommend a heavy-duty moisturizer morning and night and then moisturizing as the day goes on. My favorite for this is Elon Nail Conditioner, which is not expensive, but It's lanolin-based, and some patients are allergic to lanolin or maybe don't like it because it's a little bit sticky. And other choices could be Vaseline, Aquaphor, coconut oil, really whatever works that is a heavy-duty moisturizer. Keeping the nails short helps because then there's no pressure on the pulling up of a long nail, causing it to separate more from the nail bed. So I recommend clipping the nails short, keeping them out of water, moisturizing them, as best as you can, and avoiding the trauma that is causing the separation, or the fancy term, onycholysis. For fingernails, it will often take two to three months to resolve, and for toenails, it can take much, much longer, especially since the big toe can take 18 months to two years to grow out normally. The next most common issue that I see with nails is onychomycosis, and that term typically covers both fungal and yeast infections of the nail. This is very, very common, and it's often hard to distinguish it from onycholysis that I just was talking about. So this is where you really need a nail expert, because sometimes when there's a nail infection, it can cause the onycholysis, but just because there's onycholysis doesn't mean that there's a fungus. Fungus is often a thickened nail, and it often crumbles off and separates. The best way to diagnose it is to take some nail clippings and send them for one of two tests, either a fungal culture, which includes a KOH stain, or a PAS stain at the pathology lab. I will often do both because sometimes one is negative and the other is positive, 
And these problems are very distressing for patients. So I'd like to try to figure out what is causing it. And also the PAS stain tends to come back much more quickly, usually within one to two weeks. But the fungal culture, while you can get the KOH part of it quickly to give you an idea, the full result is often four to six weeks later. So assuming the patient is positive on one of these tests and they do have either a fungus or a yeast, in my opinion, the only truly effective treatment are oral antifungals. So these are pills and they do have side effects. There are other treatments for onychomycosis. Some people will do lasers for the nails. Some people will apply antifungal creams. There's special prescription nail polish, but in my opinion, none of it really works well. So as long as the patient can tolerate the oral medication and has normal blood work, I will encourage them to take the pills if they want to treat the problem. Treating the fingernails, it's usually two to three months of pills. The toenails are often three to four months of pills. I will often give oral Lamisil, otherwise known as terbenafine pills, and check blood work monthly, or oral Sporinox pulse therapy, which is one week out of the month. Sporinox tends to have more drug interaction, so I often will use the terbenafine pills. But there are some patients who have a yeast instead of a fungus, and then the terbenafine or the Lamisil is not going to work well for them. So we need to choose between Sporinox or otherwise known as itraconazole is the generic term, or I can give them weekly diflucan, but now they need to take a pill every week instead of a shorter course, and the pill every week can be up to six months or so. It takes longer. I recommend that patients avoid liver toxins, such as drinking alcohol when on these medications, since liver damage is one of the side effects. And if patients cannot avoid alcohol, I do not recommend taking these medications. As annoying as fungus of the nails is, we often do not even treat it. Patients often have had it for many years. It does not bother them or harm them. I would give special consideration to patients who have diabetes or who get recurrent skin infections from the fungus that is living in their nails and then goes to the skin and then the skin breaks down. And many people want to get rid of the fungus or the yeast for cosmetic reasons, and that is fine. But sometimes we just leave it alone and let it go, and that is also fine. The next most common complaint that I get about nails after onycholysis and onychomycosis is brittle and ridged nails. And these are changes that often happen with age, and there is really not much that we can do about them. I recommend eating a healthy diet, keeping the hands out of water, using a great moisturizer, which we already talked about a few times a day. If nail polish makes the nails feel better, then I'm fine with patients using nail polish for this because it evens out the ridges and sometimes their nails feel stronger with the nail polish. But there is really not much more to say or do on the brittleness and ridging of the nails as we get older. The last topic is a pigment line on the nails. And while this is usually benign, it can be a sign of skin cancer. So we always have to examine the nails and check for pigmentary lines. This is part of what I do in a skin cancer screening, for example. But oftentimes patients will come in with a line on their nail and ask, what is this? And I would say that the darker someone's skin is, the more likely they are to have normal pigmentation of their nails. Their skin is darker, their nail pigment can be darker. And when there are lots of pigment lines and they are stable and not changing, I usually will just photograph them and watch them, and this is normal. These are normal pigment lines of the nails. But if somebody has a pigmentary line on the nail that is growing or changing, or a new pigment line, or just one pigment line, then we are more concerned about the potential of skin cancer, potentially melanoma skin cancer, which can be deadly, so we don't want to miss this diagnosis. There is a sign called the Hutchinson sign where the skin at the base of the nail near the cuticle becomes dark because there's a skin cancer growing there, and so we always look for that. It's pretty rare, but if that happens, then we are more concerned and would send the patient for sure for a biopsy, or some dermatologists would do those biopsies themselves. I personally would send somebody to a hand surgeon, but there's plenty of people who will do a nail biopsy on their own, and that's fine. I would say that skin cancer of the nail is very rare, and sometimes people panic when they see a little tiny dark spot on the nail. But if it's a little tiny black or purple line and it's growing out with the nail and not growing back to the base of the nail, 
This is usually dried blood from trauma and not a mole or melanoma. A mole or melanoma of the nail, you're going to get a streak in the entire nail. So when I do my exam, I'm always looking to try to see, are there other spots? Is this trauma and growing out? Is there pigment at the base of the nail on the skin? Are there many pigment spots or just one? And the bottom line is, this is a complicated exam, and the best person to address this issue is a board-certified dermatologist. Good time to remind you that board-certified dermatologists are specially trained in skin, hair, and nails. And so any of these nail issues, the best person to see is your local dermatologist. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Dr. Rebecca Bax podcast. I'm Dr. Rebecca Bax, board-certified dermatologist. I hope this episode was informative and that you enjoyed listening. If you found this podcast useful, please give us a five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts. It helps others find us so we can help them too. Just a caveat to remember, this is not medical advice, and please see your dermatologist or doctor for questions pertaining to your specific situation. I look forward to talking with you again in the next episode.